up, we were talking about the two-word stage, um, also known as the telegraphic stage. And in the beginning, it's called the two-word stage, but the telegraphic stage actually expands out beyond two words. But when kids first start to transition from making single-word utterances, they obviously move straight to two words. And those two words, though, have a lot of detail in them that you might not expect from utterances just made up of two words. Um, the children are demonstrating with those limited utterances that they understand semantic relationships. They're beginning to develop syntactic relationships. Uh, they demonstrate clearly with the intonation that they use, that they understand the difference between things like questions and statements and orders. So they're doing that even with just two words. Um, and they use the word order that matches the word order being used by the adults around them. So they're not just arbitrarily throwing words, two words together. They're putting them in order that reflects, as I said, the semantic relationships and the syntactic word order that is appropriate for the language that they're learning. The children are focusing on a number of elements of language at this stage. Uh, they're trying to figure out a lot of things about how language works, and they, uh, they follow a number of very specific principles as they produce words and as they figure out new words. Because one of their big jobs at this point is not only to figure out little bits of grammar, but their vocabulary has to keep increasing because their world is getting bigger. Uh, you know, they've gone from what matters is I'm hungry, I'm wet, I'm cold, I'm sleepy, I'm lonely, to oh my gosh, there's sky and birds and horses and chocolate and peas and you know, the whole world is kind of exploding. Friends, uh, family members, I mean, they're, they're coming now to be able to label the whole world, and so figuring out vocabulary is really important too. So children focus very heavily on the ends of words, especially uh, they're doing this because they have to figure out where words stop and start, because they can't tell necessarily from where people stop to breathe where words stop and start, because as you know, adults can talk really fast and squish all the words together, so the words don't stop and start where I breathe. So they are listening quite carefully for probabilities. Uh, they've been doing this since birth. Right? They're listening quite carefully for certain combinations of sounds that they learn, that they have learned mean words are ending. Uh, so they listen for those. They listen for stress patterns to try and figure out where words are ending. Um, they, as we know, uh, know that it's okay to phonologically modify words as long as their meaning is still clear. So they'll continue to modify their words according to the kinds of principles we talked about. They're now getting that word order matters and they're also getting to the place where they understand certain words or certain morphemes serve certain functions. So they're not producing things like plurals yet or possessives or anything like that, but they do understand that there are things like nouns and things like verbs and things like adjectives and that these are the things that seem to matter and that they should focus on these for now. Uh, when they produce strings of utterances, they try not to put extra stuff in between. They just put these content words together. They don't want to interrupt the rich meaning of content words with these little bits and pieces that the adults around them seem to be using. They're like, why would you do that? You're, you're messing up the message. That just, that's just like garbage in between. Get the message out because you have minimal ability, so you have to get as much message out with as little effort as possible. Uh, they really prefer semantic relationships to be overtly marked. So they want, they want uh, if they're going to talk about uh, the connection between two objects, they're going to put things really close together. So if they're talking about my book, they're going to put things really close together to make that semantic relationship obvious. 
not separated out by putting lots of stuff in the middle. Um, they don't like exceptions. And we'll see as we get into children's more advanced language development that, you know, of course there are lots of exceptions to how we do things like make plurals, because you can have a mouse, but then you have mice, not mouses, right? Although you have a house and houses, right? Uh, and so they don't like exceptions. And so we'll see that they try very hard to regularize speech as they're developing. And as they come to learn about bound morphemes, which we're going to see in a little bit, they don't really like bound morphemes and other kinds of markers that don't have obvious semantic sense. So they like things like the plural. They learn the plural really early, but they have absolutely no interest in weird things like third person singular, like I go, you go, he goes. They don't care anything about that. They're like, what does that even mean? They don't care about those kind of syntactic markers at all. So they're ignoring them because they're like, I can do that with word order and that's enough. So they want to keep things simple. And as they produce speech, they focus on these different elements. Now we talked about two, the two word stage a little bit ago. We talked about how the kids are paying attention to these semantic relationships and that they're using these relationships to help them build their syntax. Now I don't expect you to learn all the examples of all these different things. I just am putting this up as an example so that you can see the kinds of relationships that children are able to express with just two words. And you can see they're doing it just with content morphemes, okay? just nouns, adjectives. Um, they do introduce this and that at some point because there might be two of a thing in the room and they need to say, do you want this book or do you want that book? And they have to be able to distinguish between those two things. So they'll, they will ultimately introduce that into their speech. But there's a huge focus on content words and things that are going to get them, get their message out with minimum effort. They can talk about possessions and they can talk about actions and they can talk about um, where something is and they can talk about doing something to something. They can do a lot of stuff with just two words and they will be very clear if you try to reinterpret what they've said. So if the child says daddy chair and it's meaning that's daddy's chair and you say oh is daddy in his chair no daddy chair in other words no you're interpreting my meaning wrong so they're quite clear on that they're trying to express these more complex ideas and if you don't understand they'll just keep saying it over and over until you get the right interpretation now once the two word stage is pretty solid and they've developed a lot of these pairing of conceptual relationships. So they can express a lot of different things. Then we start to see syntax expand and they start to fuse the parts together. So they might have been able to say my bear and bear soft, right? So first they've got a possessor and the, ob the possessor and the object and then the object and a descriptor. And now they're able to fuse that into a single utterance my bear soft. So now they're actually building sentences, building phrases, by connecting parts of two word utterances together. They also are able to expand these two word utterances from the middle. So they understand, they, they get more comfortable with the idea of pulling things apart as long as you're going to put something useful on the inside, not just like a the or an in or something like that. So They'll, say, they'll take something like throw ball, blue ball, and turn it into throw blue ball. So they can expand from the inside too, but it has to be with content words. They're not gonna do it with the, or in, or a, uh, or something like that. because Those just don't mean anything to them right now. They're not powerful enough. And we really use those, those are kind of little extra things. And they won't get to that until they've managed to develop much more complex utterances. Anybody who's ever had a kid at this stage, you know, they can, once they get to here, all bets are off, right? Pretty soon they can start making four, five, six, seven word utterances. They'll just go. And it will be verbs and nouns and adjectives and verbs and nouns and adjectives and it kind of explodes. So sometimes that stage is called the explosion. 
So once kids have made it through that stage and they've started to form the basics of the syntax for their language, so now they're forming noun phrases, verb phrases, adjective phrases, now the adults around them up the game. And now they want them to start putting in some more of the markers, and adults around them are using these markers all the time. They're using not just content morphemes, but they're using bound morphemes, right? So adults around them are using possessive and plural and all these other things. And they're also using what we call function morphemes, prepositions, articles, um, other kinds of words that fill in spots in sentences and they want the children to start using them. So they start emphasizing these more. And the children are like, okay, well, I've got all these words, and now apparently to be more, you know, to the bigger kids have more things added to their words. They can now start to put some of this, some decorative and some functional stuff into their utterances. And they insert these new bits, okay, the bound morphemes and the other function morphemes. Okay? They insert these bits according to three general principles. The first principle that they care about is regularity. As I said before, they love things that are regular. They don't like exceptions. So if a bound morpheme or function word is very, very regular, very, very consistent, then they are more likely to figure it out because it's showing up all the time in the same form, doesn't have lots of different allomorphs, okay, it's always showing up in the same form, they don't have to know any special rule necessarily to know how to make it in the right way but they do have to know where to attach it or where to insert it. That they can figure out, because they're able to figure out where words stop and start, and they're, they're starting to pay attention to where adults around them are sticking these extra bits. And so they can figure that part out. Where it goes, they can kind of get. But if it's got lots of different forms, then in the beginning they don't understand that those are all the same thing. Because a cat is a cat is cat but it's weird to think that you might have different forms of the same morpheme, right? Free morphemes don't change their form that much. Bound morphemes change their form into different allomorphs a lot. So they like really consistent forms. They also care about the complexity, particularly the semantic or syntactic complexity. How hard is it to understand what this morpheme means? Because morphemes mean stuff, right? And sometimes they mark things that are really easy to understand, like more than one. Kids get more than one, especially if you're talking about cookies or other things that they like. They are very clear on more than one. Okay? They understand more than one thing. That's a very straightforward concept. Really difficult to understand, as I said before, things like third person singular. What does that even mean, right? I mean, I can talk to adults here at the university and say, so, do you know how to make the third person singular in English? And they'll just look at me like, what the heck are you talking about? Right. So, it's a, you know, strange things that have very overt syntactic roles that aren't obvious, that you don't need to get the meaning across, kids don't care about. But if it's a very easy to understand concept for them, very concrete, then they're more likely to pick it up early. There's also the issue of frequency. How often do they hear it and how much do they need it? So is it something that occurs often in the speech that's directed at them? And is it something that would occur often in speech they might want to produce themselves? So the frequency matters a lot. So kids are more likely to integrate bound morphing than function words that have high regularity, low complexity, and high frequency. Okay, that's the that's the trifecta, right? If you can get something that's really regular, not complex, 
and really frequent, kids are going to pick it up really fast. And that's why we can actually rank the order in which kids acquire these different morphemes and start to add them to their speech. Now what I want you to know, and what I want you to be able to recognize, is those different properties of frequency, complexity, and regularity. So if I describe a situation and say, a child, you know, a child is more likely to pick up the uh, preposition in because it occurs all the time in the speech directed to the child and describes something that the child frequently or often wants to talk about, which of the properties does this reflect? You should know that it's about frequency. If I talk to you about the consistency of a form, how consistent it is, how it doesn't have a lot of different allomorphic manifestations, then you should know that that's about regularity. And if I talk about how it's easy to understand the idea, so they understand what extra meaning this morpheme is adding to their utterance, and it's a meaning that's important for them to express, then it's about the complexity. So you should be able to recognize different properties. You should also uh, be able to explain why, for example, the present progressive is the very first uh, found morpheme that most English-speaking children acquire. Let's think about it. So present progressive is ing, like jumping, running, kicking, screaming, singing, sleeping, meaning I am doing the thing right now. So let's think about this in terms of the different properties. Okay. In terms of regularity, it's 100% regular. Ing is ing is ing is ing. It always shows up as ing. Okay. Sometimes it gets abbreviated to in, like running, jumping, skipping, but, uh, but that has more to do with speed of pronunciation. It's, that's, that's, that's not an actual change in the form. People can use in and ing interchangeably, and they're both right all the time. So those aren't different allomorphic manifestations. So ing is ing is ing is ing. Super regular. In terms of semantic complexity, very straightforward. What are you doing? Jumping, sleeping, running, eating, playing, right? The idea of this is the action I'm engaging in right now is very obvious to children. They can get that idea. And what do parents ask them all the time? What are you doing? Are you playing with the kitty? Are you eating your vegetables? They're using this, you know, they're all they're using it all the time, making it really obvious. So not only does it make a ton of sense to kids, it's what I'm doing right now, right? It's the immediately occurring event. They totally understand that. So that's super concrete to them. But it's getting directed at them all the time. Because Parents and other caregivers are always talking to kids about what they're doing right now. In fact, I can't even describe it without using it because I talk about what they're doing, right? I can't even talk about this morphine without using it. So it's a very super salient morphine for kids and it meets all of the requirements. The next things that kids acquire are the function morphemes in and on, and they vary in terms of which one they get first. But in and on, okay, think about that. Super regular. In, in, in. In is always in. Okay, we don't have any other forms of it. And what it represents semantically, really obvious, right? It put your socks in the drawer. Put your feet in your socks. Put your, so put your foot in your shoe, right? Put your legs in your pants. Put your body in your bed. In is a really easy idea to get. So it's on, right? It's on my hand, on the desk, right? It's on the table. They totally get in and on. Really easy to understand, very concrete, and they occur all the time because we're always telling kids about putting, put the toys in the toy box. Put the plate on the table, right? Put the hat on your head, put the coat on your body, put the gloves on your hands. We say this stuff to kids all the time. So they're getting it directed to them all the time, semantically makes a ton of sense, and very consistent forms. 
Now, there are other languages where these have different forms. For example, in German, in and on have different forms depending on uh, what you're putting thing, what you're putting in, and what what thing you're putting in, right? And where you're putting it into. Uh, and kids learn them later because they're more complex. But in English, super regular, super frequent, very straightforward, and so kids pick these up really fast. The next one kids get is the plural. And this one's a little bit odd because the plural is the first one that kids get that has different allomorphic manifestations. Because as you know, we have several different plurals in English. I can have s, z, us, and then there's regulars, right? And it depends on what the final sound in the word is that I'm going to make a plural of. If it's a cat, it's a voiceless sound like t or k, then it's going to be s, like cats. If it's a voiced sound like g or d, it's going to be z, like dogs. And if it's a fricative like s or z, then it's going to be as, like kisses. So we have those. And then, as I said before, we have regular forms, like foot, feet, mouse, mice. Okay. So plural in English is actually quite difficult for kids to get the form of initially. But they understand semantically what it means very easily, because more than one makes a ton of sense to them. Uh, as far as we know, every language in the world and every known culture has a way to describe one and more than one. Okay? It's one of the few commonalities of all languages, the ability to talk about one and more than one. Uh, and we know that babies are aware of this phenomenon uh, very, very early in their cognitive development. So they get one and more than one. So this is a very easy idea for kids to get. So even though it's not super regular, even though there are lots of different ways to do the plural, because it's so easy to understand and because we use it so much around kids, we talk about shoes and socks and cookies and peas and glasses of milk and pairs of pants. We talk about plural things all the time. It's so frequent and it's so semantically straightforward that that overrides the fact that it's not super regular. So it, those other properties win out and kids learn the plural. And we can keep going on down this list, um, but you know, we think about things down here at the bottom, things that take a long time for kids to figure out. These are uh, a little bit weird, like um, being able to do contractions because contractions look a lot like other things. For example, she's drinking looks a lot like the possessive, you know, looks a lot like, you know, you think about she's, hers, his, it, it, it looks like it could be a plural, it looks like, you know, it, it sounds like a lot of other things. It's really hard for kids to figure out what's going on here. And you can totally get away with never doing a contraction, ever, right? You, in fact, in some forms of writing, you're not supposed to do contractions at all. And, and I think in uh, Star Trek Next Generation data, one of the weird things about his speech is that he never did contractions, ever. So he had whole, I mean, here's like this super smart android, and his dialogue never had a single contraction in it. You don't need contractions to communicate. Um, in fact, they're just, you know, they're for convenience, for speed. Uh, they make things more casual. So you don't need to do these kinds of contractions. And so kids are like, why bother, right? I got enough other stuff to figure out. I got all this walking and running and getting dressed and making friends and having a puppy and eating peas and a million other things. I'm not gonna worry about stuff like contractions, whatever, way too much work. So it takes them a long time to figure out how to do that. Now, I wanna show you the stages that kids go through when they acquire morphemes that have multiple forms. And as I said, the first one that kids get that have these multiple forms is the plural. So I'm going to walk you through the stages of the plural for all the different kinds of plurals we do. And I will expect 
on the quiz that you will be able to complete a chart of plural development uh, that looks like this. Now we're going to walk through what's going on on this chart. Okay. Uh, what I want you to notice first is that I've got four different kinds of plurals represented here. Okay. We've got book, hand, kiss, and foot. Okay. Book is one that has the voiceless sound at the end. Hand has the voiced sound at the end. Kiss has the fricative at the end. And foot is irregular. So what you're seeing on this chart are the four different kinds of plurals English-speaking kids have to figure out. They have to figure out what are the rules, because there's clearly rules for how we make these, and they're phonologically driven rules for which form of the morphing you use. And kids have to figure this out, and they figure it out in a very particular order. So I'm going to back up here and go back to the list. So first of all, they don't use any plurals at all. So it's one book, two book, three book, four book, one foot, two foot, three foot, four foot. One kiss, two kiss, three kiss, four kiss. I have a great video of my daughter doing this counting snowballs. One snowball, two snowball, three snowball, four snowball. Okay? There is no plural markers on the snowballs at all. She was still really excited about snowballs. Then, the first thing that happens, first time we see plurals really manifest, where they're not just using the, the number to tell you they're talking about more than one, and the word order to tell you that they're talking about more than one, but where they actually mark the noun itself to show you that it's plural, is with highly frequent irregular forms. Now, this seems kind of odd but it's things like feet, because we talk to kids about feet. Your feet are dirty, get your feet off the table. <laughs> Put socks on your feet. Okay. Your feet are wet, your feet are muddy. The dog's feet are muddy. We use the word feet a lot. And we don't typically talk about single, or what, talk about one foot very much. We talk about both feet, because usually both of their feet are doing something they're not supposed to do. So we talk about feet, okay, or mice. So they'll, if we, if we use that term a lot, then they get that mice is more than one mouse and feet is more than one foot. But, and they start to use this and parents are like, oh, my kid's a genius, my kid's already figured out irregular plurals. Like, you know, my genius two-year-old already knows these harder words. Whereas some of their older friends are saying things like foots. <laughs> well, what's really going on is the kid thinks that these are different words. They don't get that feet means, they understand that feet means more than one foot, but they think we have a special name for it. So they don't, it's just kind of like a mitt, a baseball mitt is a special kind of hand covering, right? And it's a different kind of thing than, say, a glove you would wear for snow, right? We have a different word for it because it has a different purpose. Well, for some reason, kids think that feet is a different word for when you have more than one foot, that we just have a special name for it. Okay. So they think it's a totally different thing. And they don't understand that there's any kind of connection between like, how you get it or that it's an irregular plural or any of that stuff. All they know is that the, the sequence feet means more than one foot. Then they start to go, wait, 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 wait. People are marking more than one by putting inf extra information on the nouns. Okay, so they, they discover the plural morphing. They suddenly realize that people are putting tagging stuff onto nouns. So they're saying dog, doggies. Kitty, kitties. They're like, wait a second. They get the relationship. They're putting this z thing on the end of these words to make it plural. That that's interesting. I can do that. I can add that. That makes sense. I can do that. Okay. And when they do that, they are very good at getting the s and z forms. 
So like cat, cats, and dog, dogs, they're good at those. Okay? What they don't recognize yet is that as is also plural. They don't get that. So they don't know to add that as a plural. So they start off with just s and, s and they apply it everywhere. Okay. That means that what was feet now suddenly becomes foots. Because that's how it would be if you were doing it in a regular way, right? It's hand, hands, foot, foots. Makes total sense, right? And remember, they don't like variation, they like regularity. So they start to do what we call over-regularization, or over-regularization, and that's where you apply a rule in places where it doesn't go. But you're trying to be more consistent. You're trying to make the language more regular, more consistent, with less variation. Because variation is confusing. Variation is stuff you have to learn. If you can just find a simple rule and apply it everywhere, great. And that's how more things like ing work. So let's try it with this one. And you know, the s, z, difference is actually really straightforward. If the sound at the end is voiceless, use s. If the sound at the end is voiced, use z. So all you gotta do is just keep your vocal folds doing whatever they were doing at the end of the world already, and you're good to go. So it's not hard to do once they figured it out. Then they realize that es is also plural, and then it goes places that the other ones don't go. And they start to put is everywhere because they can say foots, right? Well, what goes after s? Us. So then they start saying footses, right? So they start double pluralizing things because if they can say dogses, catses, footses, us will fit everywhere. If you've made an already plural, then us is the way you pluralize it. So they start double pluralizing things. At this point, their parents think the kids have lost their mind. Because, but just a short while ago, you were saying feet, and now you're saying footses. What's wrong, you know? Is there something wrong with my child? Is my child getting stupider? No, your child's actually getting much, much smarter when it comes to language. But they're trying to separate out these different allomorphs, and they have to figure out how it works. Then, they get to a stage where they're able to distribute the allomorphs correctly, but the irregulars are still wrong. So they're still saying foots or footses. Okay. They're still getting the irregulars wrong. Then they have to memorize which ones don't take the rule. And that's a, the last thing they ever do because they're very resistant to this idea that they shouldn't be able to apply the rule everywhere once they've figured out the rule. So now if we take a look at this chart, you should see this pattern. Okay, so it's stage one, no marking, right? Plurals are not marked on the word itself, they're just marked with numbers before. One book, two book, three book, four book. One hand, two hand, three hand, four hand. At stage two, they've transitioned, but only for the irregular ones that they think are new words. So they understand that one foot is called a foot and two feet is called feet, but they don't understand that they're related to each other. So they have just the irregulars. Then they get to the stage where they're able to use s and z allomorphs. So they're attaching those where they go correctly. They're also overgeneralizing and attaching them to a regular form. So we get books, hands, kiss. So it's still one kiss, two kiss, three kiss, four kiss, okay. and foots. They're treating foot like it's a regular noun and pluralizing it as if it were regular. Next stage, they discover us and stick it everywhere because it goes after fricatives. The problem is that the other forms of the plural are also fricatives, so they just attach it everywhere. Bookses, handses, kisses, footses. Then they figure out the rule for the different allomorphs, how to divide it up, and they have correctly books, hands, kisses, but footses is still wrong because it's irregular. And their final act of resistance is to hold off doing anything irregular if they can help it. And then finally, they say, all right, I guess I have to use mice and feet and sheep, not sheeps, and fish, you know, and money, not monies, right? 
right? So they regularize it, at, at, or they, they accept the variation to the rule, and they just memorize that form. Yeah. yeah. How would you how would you do this on the quiz? Like, would you have us name the stages, or like? So what I'll do is I will have a grid on the quiz mm -hmm. that will have the stages. I'll have stage one through six listed on the side. I'll have words across the top, and I will have some of the boxes filled in. And you will have to complete the chart to show me that you know what the right form at each stage would be for each kind of plural. So for example, I might not have, like at stage two, I could delete one of those, mm -hmm. and you would have to know what the right form was. Kind of like the books this right. over here. Right, so I might, on, for this particular stage, you know, I might um, say I deleted kisses, you would have to know how to make that. You have to know that at that stage, they've gone from kiss to kisses and they have the right form. Oh, I was talking about stage five where they started um, differentiating. Right, you know, so I might leave this one blank on the test and you would have to know at this stage that you should be writing either foots or footses there because they're still not doing the irregular plural correctly. So you should, what you should be able to do is give it a new set of words, and I can tell you it will not be book, hand, kiss, and foot. I'll give you something different. Um, but you are going to have on the chart most of the IPA that you need. You just have to know, you have to know what to do with it. Right? So you don't have to write IPA all over your card because you're going to have, I mean, I, if I give you almost everything in the first row where I give you some of these other things, you should be able to figure out, you should be able to read this by now and figure out which one to keep. Because irregular forms typically have a change in the vowel, like foot, feet, mouse, mice. So you should be able to tell which vowel to use. And uh, you should be able to read this basic stuff. You don't have to read whole sentences, just single words. And uh, you'll have the words across the top, so that should help you figure it out. Okay? Now, we also see children doing this with syntactic forms. So their speech is getting more complicated. They're not only learning how to build the structure of words and make those more complicated, but they're learning to build sentences and make them more complicated. So one of the things that children have to learn how to do is to make a sentence negative. Because it's possible that you can have an affirmative sentence or a negative sentence. Let me give you some examples and then I'll come back to this list. So for example, a child needs to be able to say things like, the dog does not bite. Or the dog doesn't bite. Because someone might walk up to the child and say, does your dog bite? No. The dog doesn't bite. They have to be able to express that negative idea. Um, also, there's, you know, did you wash your hands? No, I didn't wash my hands. They need to be able to express those kinds of negative ideas. I did not do something or that does not have that property. No, the, the milk is not cold. Right? They have to be able to do that. And they have to learn how to make negative sentences. Where, does neg where do negatives fit? And in different languages, the negatives don't go in different places. English does all kinds of crazy stuff with negatives. So um, they're going to go through phases where their negatives get more sophisticated. So let me walk you through that and then come back and we'll look at this specific example. Okay. So in the beginning, just like with plurals, no negative marker at all. Okay. So they say, they indicate that something's negative by shaking their head when they're saying. So sleepy. Means I'm not sleepy. So they shake their head to tell you that their intent is negative because they don't put a word to mean negative. Negative is a gesture or a face. Because you can even say no without saying a word, right? So they just impose that over the sentence. Hungry or peas. Unlike my child who ate frozen peas out of a bag like they were candy. Um, then they just put no at the beginning. So no sleepy, no hungry, no dog bite. Okay, so 
three. Just put no at the beginning or whatever negative is appropriate. And they are aware that there are some different negative words, but no is their favorite because that's the one they hear the most. No, no, no. My first sentence, according to my mother, was quit that. Guess what I heard all the time. My second full sentence, according to my mother, was quit that, I said. So you know that what I heard all the time was, Kim, quit that. Quit that, I said, over and over because I got that really quick. Quit that. Negatives. Kids are really into negatives. Okay. Then they start to integrate the negative form into the sentence because in our negative sentences, we put the negative typically somewhere inside. It's woven inside the structure of the sentence. It's not just no hungry. right? It's I'm not hungry. Okay. Not no I hungry or something like that. Some languages do it that way. That's not how English does it. Um, and then they start to put in the copula. Copulas are helping verbs like to be, or to go, or to do. So those, these are helping verbs. They have to add those in because sometimes the negatives get attached to those helping verbs. They're not. So they have to learn to add those in so that they can attach the negative to them. Then they learn to separate those out so they actually learn to do copulas and put extra words in the sentence because they need them to make the negative. So the negative actually helps them learn how to make fancier affirmative sentences. And then they start being able to use that, those copulas and extra words in the affirmative form too. Okay, so let me show you how this works um, with two different negative forms in English. So we'll start off with dog bite. The dog doesn't bite, just dog bite shaking head. Then no dog bite, adding the negative just at the front of the affirmative sentence. Then we see some integration, dog no bite. So now the no is moving inside the structure of the sentence, but it's still in the wrong form. Then we get the addition of the helping verb do, because we would say the dog does not bite stretched it all out, but they figure out doesn't first. They don't understand doesn't is a fusion of do and not together because it's got that weird third person thing in it. It's really confusing. So they just think that's what you have to put in there. Doesn't is one whole unit and they don't split it up. But once they get that do dog doesn't bite, then they figure out that you can actually pull it apart to dog does not bite, and that means the same thing. And that's when they discover do. And then they can th say things like the dog does bite if they need to. The dog does bite, the dog does not bite, and they can make both of those forms. So the negative actually helps them learn to form the more complex affirmative sentence. Because dog bite is not grammatical by itself. But the dog does bite, or the dog bites, those are both OK. But the child learns to add in that do verb by learning the negative first. We see the same thing happening uh, with this other construction. So you ask the child, did you wash your hands? Wash hands, he said, wash my hands. No wash hands. Now in this case, the no doesn't integrate into the middle because it wouldn't in the structure because it's going to attach to the copula at the beginning. I didn't wash my hands, right? So didn't wash hands would be the form that the child wants. So the child actually shows at this stage three that he or she knows that here the negative needs to integrate and here it doesn't. And that's pretty slick that they're getting that the negative moves sometimes and doesn't move other times. But that's why learning negatives is hard. Then they start to do the blending with the copula. Then they separate it out. And then they're able to do the affirmative with the copula, too. I did wash my hands. Okay. And they drop the I because it's clear that I is what they mean, because who else would they be talking about? And so you know, why bother with a word that everybody knows? And in fact, there are many languages in the world that would automatically drop that anyway, even in normal adult speech, because it's obvious. If I say didn't wash hands, who else would I And you know, we see this with other forms, too. Um, kids have to learn how to make questions in English. We have lots of different kinds of questions. And the questions, question forms are kind of complicated. Um, for
for example, yes, no questions. Kids will start off just saying things like, Maggie can play, and then they learn that they have to switch the role of the verb and the noun and say, can Maggie play? And they don't like to change the order of things, but this is required to make the question correct. So in the beginning, they would just prefer to use intonation to convey the message. Because if I say, can Maggie, or Maggie can play, you understand what I mean. So you would answer appropriately, and I've expressed the meaning I want. But I learn eventually that I have to do that subject verb inversion in order to produce the correct syntactic form. And I'll learn that much later because I don't like moving, switching the order of words. That seems, it looks like the order's wrong, but we have to do it that way. So they do it with WH questions too. Um, they have to get this word inversion, and kids don't like to move elements around if they can help it. So, but they do eventually get this, so they can start off with where I should put it, and then they get to the inversion. Where should I put it? But they, with the negative, they don't do it quite right, and they'll say, why I can't have it, as opposed to why can't I have it. With the negative, they don't do the inversion. <clears throat> then they finally get the inversion with negative sentences. So what I want you to know about these different forms for the syntax is that the children progress through stages just like they do with the acquisition of different morphemes. As they're learning different bound morphemes and function words, they're also learning the rules at these other levels of language for creating more complex forms in the, at the phrase and the sentence level. They're doing these things in parallel. So you get lots of really interesting combinations of word forms and sentence forms as the kids are wrestling with these different levels of language but they're learning each one of them independently. Uh, because they have, just like you had to learn about features, and you had to learn about phonemes, and you had to learn about morphemes, they have to learn about all those things too, all the structure built in. They have to, and they have to extract rules from the environment because their parents don't know what they do. If I asked you to tell me how do you make a negative question in English, you'd be like, what? Like parents don't know how to teach kids this stuff. They just have to model it and the kids have to figure it out. So it takes a while for them to pull these different things apart. Um, but I will want you on the test to know, you should know kind of the rough sequence of acquisition for these different forms, particularly the ones that I gave you charts for. So you should be able to do the negative, acquisition of the negative, and the acquisition of the plural. And if I give you a chart with some of the stuff missing, you should be able to fill in the parts that are missing to show me that you see, you know the sequence of stages. And the negative is the one we don't like, the no dollar five. Right, right, okay. that negative, yeah. The ones where I gave you charts. Any questions about that stuff? Okay, I want to take a minute. Instead of jumping onto this, we can start here with this next time, but I want to give you back, um, these are just the score sheets 